I want to take a look at a very important topic, one that has been neglected for many years and is still neglected, um, but at least now people are talking about it. Some very important people are starting to acknowledge the problems with this issue, and of course we're talking about mental health. Recently, some NFL players sat out some games because of some mental health issues, and I think that's raised some awareness, so people are actually talking about the subject a little bit right now. So I thought it'd be a good time to talk about it. Um, um, we're going to look at, is it an actual issue right now? Has it actually been a problem that is worsening or is it getting better? What are solutions for this issue? And is there anything we can do despite the gridlock in Washington, which seems to not be able to accomplish anything? It's an important subject for me. I myself have had some issues with this. So let's get into it. Okay, guys. So again... On the topic of mental health, Calvin Ridley, Lane Johnson recently set some games out in regards to having some mental health issues, which is something that I don't recall seeing in the past. So it's very interesting that you have celebrities, important figures actually talking about this subject now. Maybe it'll cause some enough awareness to get something done on this issue and it's an issue that we really need to get something done on um, as soon as possible unfortunately it doesn't seem like we'll ever make any progress here um, it seems a little bit hopeless as I would say is the word at times when you start talking about stuff like this and, and trying to hope that the government will actually do something and you know is it an issue where we can do something despite government not doing anything uh, maybe uh, we need to talk about that the data is out there. We're going to get into the data of, of the issues with depression and mental health. But needless to say, especially when you look like look at charts like this, you can clearly see, especially amongst the youth, you can see a pretty clear uptrend in major depressive episodes being reported. Here's more data. More teenagers are experiencing depression. Pretty clear. You can see the uptrend as well major depressive episode just from 06 to 2018 that's only 12 years is up from 8% to 14 and a half percent pretty major move of course the question always is are more people reporting issues in the past they may not have yeah of course that's probably part of it uh, but more people are also receiving treatment i think it's fairly clear that we have an issue and it's an issue that continues to get worse um, here's even more information this is related to COVID-19, and of course, you know, it's hard to argue that we haven't had more depression and more anxiety during COVID. The dotted lines are pre-pandemic, and the solid lines are pandemic. You can see clearly they've moved up on both, for both women and men. What has been done in the past to try to address this issue? Now, I know that there's things that the government should stay out of. There's things that the government can do and there's things they shouldn't do and this isn't a debate on what the government should or shouldn't do my personal opinion is the government has a role in our society it should be limited as much as possible and certainly they shouldn't have waste and that's a that's a whole entirely other video <laughs> i'll get into that the government does waste and a tremendous amount of money they're not efficient in most cases so without getting into whether the government should be involved in this or not, my personal opinion is I do think this is an issue that the government probably should be somewhat involved in. I think it would be hard to solve this through the free market. The free market is certainly very efficient with certain things. But for now, we're just going to talk about what the government has done and how they have failed to this point to address this issue. Okay, so in 1963, JFK signed this act. And basically what this act did is it moved people with mental health issues out of institutions and attempted to treat them in their communities, which if you know the history of mental health institutions, there was a lot of issues back in the day. Um, there's some movies, I think One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is one where some of that stuff seems crazy that they did some of that to people, like lobotomies and things like that, but that stuff actually did happen. By and large, those institutions were not the greatest thing. So this was a nice step, a nice idea. The problem is the funding has never been there 
to properly treat people once they got rid of the mental health institutions. It's not that they got rid of mental health institutions either necessarily. It's just the the focus has been more on community care. So in the 80s, Jimmy Carter finally did pass a bill that provided more funding for these community mental health centers, but it was repealed in 1981 by Ronald Reagan when they went into the whole Reaganomics thing and deregulation and, and cutting the size of government. And for what it's worth, I am a fan of cutting the size of government within reason, but I do believe that as a society, we should take care of people who need it the most. And I think that a very efficient mental health government system, I think, would be a good thing. And I don't think it was a great idea to cut uh, mental health funding when we already had a lack of funding. This is just a paper that talks about from the National Institutes of Health, which talks about addressing the problem of severe underinvestment. So we know that there's underinvestment, um, and this gets into a lot of details of how underinvested we are as a society. Like, for instance, you can read through, there's tons of statistics here, but the average percentage of national health spending devoted to mental health was about 0.5%. So 0.5% of the health spending for a country goes to mental health. And we, there is a, per, a much higher percentage of people with medical issues is mental health than 0.5%. There's some serious problems with the amount that we're funding it. So what's been happening as a result of taking people out of institutions and not funding the community centers well enough is many mentally ill people end up in jail. Some studies say it's as much as 10 times more at the national level. And in some states, it's, it's even higher. You can read through this report as well, but there's a lot more information supporting the idea that we are underfunding mental health drastically in the United States. And I think probably worldwide as well. Um, lack of access, especially in rural areas, there's just not great access. Um, there's data in here as well that you can read through, but there's just long waits for treatment. There's not near enough psychiatrists. And there's still the social stigma component, but that is just one thing that I think as a society we can do without government help. We can do a lot here on our own to kind of eliminate the social stigma. But we need government's help, I think, on some of the other stuff. Unfortunately, our government doesn't work. <laughs> There's complete deadlock. Nothing ever gets passed. So here's another attempt that the government did in 1996, Mental Health Parity Act. Um, this was another Kennedy, one of the Kennedys, I believe, that did this. Anyways, or he's one of the sponsors. Basically what this meant is what insurance companies were doing is they were largely not treating mental health the same as other sorts of health problems. So they were not paying out at the same rate. So what this attempted to do is make mental health and the rest of health be treated the same by insurance. But of course, as insurance companies do, they found loopholes and ways to get around this. Immediately after MHPA was enacted, insurances, insurers and employers began finding ways to circumvent the legislation. Of course they did. <laughs> Larger emphasis on cost sharing was one strategy used by insurers. Higher co-payments, deductibles, and out-of-pocket maximums. Limits on the number of caps, number of visits with a care provider, or number of days in a hospital visit were imposed. This is just one of many, many things that's been done. Again, shortage. There's a big shortage of psychiatrists. And this comes from the National Council for Mental Wellbeing. Parity. Okay, yeah, so this one talks about issues with parity and service denials. Medical necessity is often used as a reason to deny claims for mental health. 29% of mental health care claims are denied versus 14% for medical care. So this is hard evidence yet again that we do not have parity. <laughs> the parity law is not being enforced properly. What do we do about this? There is this from the Kennedy Forum where you can submit a, plate, a complaint if you denied coverage for mental health. Now, will it go anywhere? Probably not, but it's at least something that you can do. 
What's the government been doing in regards to mental health? Okay, so this website is GovTrack, govtrack.us. Pretty cool website. Probably a website I will be referencing quite a bit in my videos. You can look at the number of bills for this Congress. Actually, let's look at uh, the current Congress. Subject health, subject to mental health, all resolutions, and ones that have actually been enacted. So we've had 326 introduced, and we've had four that actually passed. And when you look at these bills, a lot of these bills, there's several of these are for veterans. In fact, I believe most of these are for veterans. In fact, I'm pretty sure all of them are for veterans. And most of it is just tacked on stuff onto the end of other bills. You look at the previous Congress, Advancing Research to Prevent Suicide. When you start reading a lot of these bills, and I started reading through a lot of these, a lot of this stuff is just changing wording in previous bills. No new funding, no new legislation, just slight changes to old legislation. And some of it is just slight little additions to the end of Appropriations Act, like this coronavirus stimulus bill. This is a NOAA bill. <laughs> so somehow there was a, some mental health attached to that. There's a lot of veteran stuff, which is great. I'm a veteran as well. I, I love seeing that. But we need to take care of everybody in this country. And I think we're trying to do better with veterans. We still have a long ways to go. We've got a lot more to do in terms of mental health as a country as a whole. Every time there's a shooting, people make the argument that we need to take care of our mental health. We have a mental health crisis. And that's true. I agree with that. A lot of these mental, a lot of these shootings, the people had severe mental issues. Most shootings, the people had a criminal history and they had, they've been in the system. They've probably been mentally evaluated, but they didn't get proper treatment. A lot of these shootings could be prevented with better mental health. The gun issue, that's a tough one. I tend to be a Second Amendment supporter myself as well. However, we'll get into that. <laughs> we'll get into that in another video. That's a completely other video. There's probably some things on the gun side with the shootings that could be done that would not infringe on the Second Amendment, I think. But we'll get into that at some other point. Charity is one thing you can do. Yes, the government is underfunding mental health. So perhaps you could give to charity. Now, what I'll say about this is you should not give to charity. You should not give to charity if you're living paycheck to paycheck, if you can't take care of your own family. It, this should only be for with extra money, and you should only donate to charities that it's a cause that you really believe in. So for me, this is a cause I, I believe in pretty heavily, so perhaps it'd be one that I would be interested in. And then if, if it is, if you are in that situation where you have excess money, you have excess capital and your, your, your family is well taken care of and you have quite a bit of uh, reserve capital, you have an emergency fund and your family is well taken care of and there's very little issues with money. Basically, you are financially free, you're independent. Then only then should you consider charity. That's my view. Um, but a lot of people like to give to charity even because it makes them feel good. And I, and I understand that. And even though they maybe they shouldn't be, they still do. So I'm going to try to help you out with that. Um, the Charity Navigator website. There's several, there are several charity ratings websites. The research I did, Charity Navigator, seems to be perhaps the best one out there. Um, if anybody has any opinions otherwise or has done research as well in this topic, let me know. I may do a video on this as well at some point, but Charity Navigator, from what I've seen, and if you start reading through how they calculate, their main criteria is financial health and accountability and transparency. Um, those are the main criteria they use. It's not a polling system like some of these are using, which can be rigged. So it's pretty good, I think. It's a little bit difficult of a website to search, but if you do category health diseases disorders dip, disciplines and do keywords mental um, you'll get quite a few of these charities that do pop up 
Now, there's quite, quite a few different ones. I only get five in this search because the search on this website's a little bit funky. And there's different categories. Like, for instance, I have a son with autism. So autism is certainly a mental health uh, disorder. So myself, I'd probably be more interested in mental health charities that maybe focus on that area. So find one that maybe focuses in your area. Research it on here. Make sure they have relatively good ratings because a lot of these charities do waste a lot of your money. A lot of them are pretty corrupt. So the worst thing you could do is donate to one. Well, it's not, I mean, it's some of the money probably still gets used, but you want your dollar to be used effectively. So please do the research if you can before you donate to one of these charities. Um, I'm trying to help you out with that here. This is a curated list by Charity Navigator of some mental health organizations. And you can find plenty highly rated ones in here. And some of these will be in the next. So I found this from DonorBox, the top 13 mental health charities making a big impact 2020. And I looked through each of these on that website. And to save you guys a little time, I made a little spreadsheet that I will share with you guys. Showing the overall highest rated ones. Um, so Strong Minds obviously has the best rating, but some of these don't have ratings. It doesn't mean they're bad. It might be they're a fairly new um, charity. So you still may want to research some of these others. But I would highly recommend, if possible, sticking to ones that have higher ratings. You know, 90 or above overall, I think, would be where you want to spend your money. It's my personal opinion. Now... We go full screen. Yeah, let's go full screen. We're in, we're through the tabs. What else can we do as a society uh, to help with this situation? Outside of obviously lobbying our politicians, unfortunately, they listen to the lobbyists with the most money. They're not going to listen to most of us. Um. I think a big thing is just talking to each other, uh, trying to, you know, ask questions, ask how you're doing, ask people how they're doing. I think if we all did that, it, because you can kind of tell when somebody's kind of down, you know, I think just ask them how they're doing. They're probably going to say, oh, I'm fine. But you might start a conversation that could be very beneficial that maybe they will open up to you. Um, and I think saying things like, Hey man, if you ever need anything, I'm here for you. I think that's beneficial. Um, I think we need to be more there for each other as a society. We're very closed as a society. We're, we're in our own worlds. And I think that's contributing to higher mental health issues. I mean, humans are not meant to be non-communicative with other humans. And in many ways, despite all sorts of ways to communicate now, we don't communicate. We don't sit down at a table and talk to each other, just have conversations with each other. So I think that's a big thing. Just connect more with people around you. And I'm as much to blame as anybody. I'm not good at this. Um, it's something I need to do better at. I mean, my, myself, I've, I've spent a lot of time focusing on myself, trying to improve myself, working on YouTube, working on my other skills. Um, and not, you know, not going to social functions, ignoring a lot of friends when they ask me to go do things so I'm as much to blame as anybody else out there um, I guess let me know what else you think could be done because I, I think we can do a lot in spite of a failed political state <laughs> um, I'm sure I'm missing plenty of things that I could say here but there could be other videos in the future if, if we can come up with some ideas. Uh, maybe start some support groups or something in your 
in your area. I know I've had the issue too with like counselors and psychiatrists and how and how much they cost and health insurance paid zero <laughs> when I went to them. And I'm in a situation where financially, I mean, I'm in pretty good shape. So, I mean, I could pay for a psychiatrist. I really could. Um, but truth be told, I haven't found one that's that good. <laughs> so uh, there's that as well. And yet yeah, limited access, wait times, I've experienced that as well. Um, yeah. There's a lot that we can do, I think, as a society. We just we need to talk more. I think that's the big thing. I've been rambling on for quite a while now. What are we at here? 20 some minutes. So I'm going to stop the video. We'll talk about it in the comments. Let me know what you guys think. We'll see you next time.